Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you can all uh, hear me speak. Um, my name's Stephen Pettit. I'm a, a cardiologist. Uh, I work at Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge, and, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak um, about, as you say, the difficult question of when one should start mechanical circulatory support in patients with uh, acute heart failure. Uh, these are my, my declarations of, of, of interest. Um, I guess if I had to summarize my talk uh, in one sentence, I would say that you should start with the end in mind. Um, and with that uh, in, in thought, I wanted to present a case uh, that can be viewed in a couple of different ways. Uh, so this was a, a, a female patient who was referred to our hospital um, from, a, from, a, from a, another hospital where she had presented with a new diagnosis of acute heart failure and had spiralled rapidly into cardiogenic shock and multi-organ failure. And at the point of referral, she was acidotic, uh, she had a very high lactate, and a retrieval team was sent from our hospital. And they, they actually found that she was unsafe to transfer and placed her onto central VA ECMO. And they brought her back to our hospital and we converted her to a Centromag Bivad and, and all her end organ function recovered and we urgently listed her. And we transplanted her and the explanted heart showed features of giant cell myocarditis. And this is now five or six years down the line. So, so you could present this as a, as a real success story. Um, but there's another way of looking at the case, and that is that in the period where she was without pressure and flow, she sustained really quite a lot of injury. Uh, she was left with an ischemic optic neuropathy, a cranial nerve palsy, uh, epilepsy. She has quite marked visual impairment, um, and this has had a profound impact on her ability to pursue a career in graphic design, which, what, which is what she wanted to do. Um, she struggles with independent living. Uh, she's had problems with her residency status. She's worried about her relationships, her future ability to have have children. Um, and um, she's actually um, presented or, or displayed art at the, at the British Museum um, in an exhibition for brain injured patients. And, and, and this, was, this was a picture that she did for us in the centres. So you can look at MCS um, often from, from two different lights. Uh, there's a great deal of attention focused on survival, which is a, a very important outcome measure. But actually, um, quality of life in the long term is also an, an important thing to think about. So in terms of when we should be starting MCS for acute heart failure, the, I think that this is a treatment for the very unwell patient. Um, so we're talking in sky stage terms about people in stage D or stage E of cardiogenic shock. Um, and if you wish to recognize those stages, some of the sort of simple metrics that we can look at are things like serum lactate, urine output, acid base balance. These are probably um, the simplest ways of identifying uh, those with cardiogenic shock who are, who are deteriorating and are really running into, in, into big trouble. Um, in our institution, we great, place a great deal of weight on pulmonary artery catheters, both for reasons of, 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 of prognostication, to help us estimate things like cardiac power output, but also to look at the relative uh, contributions of left and right ventricular performance and to try and decide what sort of mechanical circulatory support strategies might be uh, appropriate. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Thiel, uh, sorry, Professor Thiel may have said, um, things like cardiac power output are actually very powerful markers of a prognosis in patients with cardiogenic shock. Um, and if despite the best you can do with inotropic and vasoactive drugs, you've got someone who has got a mean arterial pressure of 70 or less and cardiac output of three liters a minute or less, that person is in very, very big trouble indeed. And these are people in whom you should be thinking seriously about mechanical circulatory support. Um, the modality that we often turn to when things are uh, very bad is peripheral veno-arterial ECMO. Um, this has been dealt with by other speakers, and I don't wish to go into this in any more detail here. Um, from my, with respect to answering the question I've been asked, when should you start acute heart failure? Um, often, actually, the, the, the tough decision about peripheral ECMO is when is it likely to be inappropriate? When, when shouldn't you be doing it? Um, and, and that can actually be the, the, the more important question than, than when should you be doing it. And, and, and our belief is that in people who've had unwitnessed cardiac arrests or prolonged episodes of CPR, um, then, then, then ECMO-assisted CPR is, is likely to be futile. Um, if there is something about the patient that makes VA ECMO ineffective or dangerous, then, then that would be a, a, an inappropriate time to use it. Um, and, and thinking about the end in mind, um, if you think that heart function is going to be unrecoverable, 
and the patient has some problem that means that they are never going to be a candidate for heart transplantation. And that could be active malignancy, it could be severe chronic dysfunction of another organ, or if they have some sort of severe neurological or psychiatric disease, then, then, then again, um, mechanical circulation support for acute heart failure is, is likely to be inappropriate in that setting. Um, one of the problems from my perspective is that adverse events are very common with, with uh, support like peripheral VA ECMO. And if you support people for more than a, a couple of weeks, you almost inevitably will end up uh, in problems with either bleeding or infection or, or limb ischemia, depending on your cannulation. Um, and, the, and the thing that we really fear the worst, which is left ventricular distension and stasis and left ventricular thrombosis. And, and to a certain extent, um, uh, given long enough, the, these adverse events are, are just inevitable in patients with peripheral VA mode. So, uh, so like the picture says, if you hit this sign, you, you will hit that bridge. Um, as has been alluded to, there are other forms of mechanical circulation support that in some ways are more physiological. Um, impellers are something that has been uh, discussed about. These are percutaneous LVADs. Um, that can be beneficial both for venting the, the LV. Um, and whilst in some situations people step from impellers up to ECMO, um, actually the reverse strategy is sometimes possible as well. So stepping from a VA ECMO down to a percutaneous LVAD, allowing yourself to find out whether the right ventricle is able to cope with isolated LVAD support, and then maybe bridging onto an implantable LVAD. So, so there are lots of sort of complex interrelationships between these, these modalities of support. Um, but in the same way as adverse events are common with peripheral VA ECMO, these adverse events are also uh, common with impeller. And if you look at the US FDA database, you'll find um, an, an ever-increasing number of adverse events that are being reported with, with these types of devices. And in fact, in some big data studies from the UK, or, uh, from the US rather, albeit uh, observational studies, not, 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 uh, not randomized controlled trials, there is some suggestion that, uh, that, that percutaneous LVADs impellers may, may be associated with, with harm. Um, I work in a big heart transplant center. Um, one of the things that we recognize is that it often takes time to support people until we can go on and get a definitive treatment for them, like a heart transplant. And so whilst we may start out on our MCS journey with ECMO or with Impella, actually we often find that, that other forms of central me mechanical circulatory support are needed for the very sickest patients or for people in whom long periods of support are anticipated, particularly when they have biventricular involvement. And actually, we quite frequently turn to, uh, to the Centromag BIVAD um, as, a, as, a, as a configuration that we can rely on for, for, for sometimes many months, and that we have an enormous amount of institutional experience with in, in bridging people to transplantation. Uh, so this is an example of, of someone on a, on a central bank BIVAD who was actually interestingly in VF for the majority of his uh, BIVAD support, although actually still in sinus rhythm underneath for the eagle eyes of you uh, looking at the central venous pressure trace. Um, the use of short-term MCS in the UK has increased dramatically in the last 10 years. So all of our data from the UK is, uh, it, it has, is mandated to be uh, reported to NHS blood and transplant, and an annual report is generated. Um, and, and we're doing a lot more uh, VA ECMO and a lot more short-term NCS than we were doing over, uh, over, over the last 10 years. Uh, so this is, a, this is a very sort of uh, big trend from our perspective. Um, and, and as I say, we have to start with the end in mind. I, I'm an advanced heart failure cardiologist, and very simply, there are really only four ways this is going to end up. Um, either patients get transplanted, or they get converted to an implantable LVAD, or they recover, or something happens to them that means that we think that palliation is the, is the right strategy. So, so when we start out with MCS for acute heart failure, we have to be very clear in our mind about what our exit strategies are um, and, um, and start with that in mind. Um, Real-world outcomes in the United Kingdom, I'm afraid, are not great with short-term mechanical circulation support. And it's important that we are honest with referrers and with patients and also with their families about that. Most of the action happens in the first couple of months. But if you take all comers two months after going on short-term MCS in the UK, around a third of people have died on support, around a quarter of people have been transplanted, just under 20% of people have been transferred over to a long-term device, 
uh, just under 20% have been explanted, and less than one in 10 are still alive on short-term support. So this is this is what actually happens in the real world in the UK after we initiate short-term MCS for, for acute heart failure. Um, if we're to deliver this in a country in a joined up fashion, then really you need networks of care, you need a hub and spoke approach. Um, and, and that actually involves, as I mentioned in the first patient, transferring some very, very sick people between hospitals. So this is a tough thing to do. Um, you need a lot of resource to transfer patients safely. Um, and, and at the moment in the UK, that is actually not something that is commissioned. So we, we occasionally go out and pick people up on ECMO, um, but it takes a lot of us out of the hospital where we should be and puts us in other parts of the country. Um, interestingly, in Norway, they use F-16 fighter jets to transfer people around. Actually, they don't, I'm lying. Uh, but they did use an F-16 fighter jet to transfer a load of ECMO equipment around in order to repatriate patients. So maybe in years to come, I'll be in the backseat of fighter jets. It could be, it could happen. Um, as other people have alluded to, there's more data coming, so keep a close eye on this. Um, there are some real experts in this session talking who are who are key uh, opinion leaders in the field and, and, and who are running these trials. So I'm looking out for the results of the Danish-German cardiogenic shock trial. I'm looking out for the results of, of, of Euroshock. Watch this space. So take-home messages, um, the basics of cardiogenic shock or hemodynamic confirmation, think about the diagnosis, think about sky stage, and it's it's the D and E really that, 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 that mechanical support may be appropriate for. I think temporary MCS can be a life-saving uh, treatment for carefully, carefully selected patients with acute heart failure. There's lots of options, but none of them are straightforward and you need an exit strategy. What happens if they don't recover? Um, and you have to expect, sadly, that there will be high adverse event rates and suboptimal outcomes in the real world at the moment. And if you want to, to commission this in your country, then you need networks of care, you need very clear lines of communication. And I suspect that better evidence is going to be required to persuade uh, those um, uh, budget holders um, to actually open the purse strings and allow us to do this. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Stefan, thank, Stefan, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Uh, you answered many important topics. We may come back to that at the discussion. It's my pleasure now to hand over to Alain for the rest of our session. Thank you uh, so much, uh, 